Cell Sites and Networks. In this module, we will cover cell sites and networks. We will take a look at a brief history of cell phones, how cell phones work, cell sites, and sectors. A brief history. In 1947, Douglas Ring of Bell Labs proposed the use of a wireless network based on antennas covering hexagonal cells. A single antenna would cover three cells. Notice the image in the left with the red, green, and yellow hexagons. Each of the three hexagonal cells would represent a sector, and the cell site or tower would be in the center. A network of cell sites would look like the image on the right. Later, Bell Labs and Motorola competed to produce the first cellular network. In 1973, Martin Cooper of Motorola made the first cellular call to his rival Joel Engel at Bell Labs. This call took place in New York using a Motorola Dynatac 8000X. From there, the cellular networks grew and evolved. Here are some of the milestones. The first 1G network was in Japan in 1979. The first US 1G network was in Chicago in 1983. The first 2G network was in Finland in 1991, and the first text message was sent in 1992. The first 3G network was in Japan in 2001. The first 4G network was in Finland in 2009. And the FCC approved 5G Spectrum on July 14, 2016. The Next Generation Mobile Network Alliance believes that 5G should be rolled out by 2020. How Cell Phones Work Cell phones are radio transceivers. They use radio waves to receive and transmit voice calls and data communications. Instead of using one frequency to send and receive, like a walkie-talkie or a CB radio, cell phones use one frequency to transmit and another frequency to receive. Also, instead of communicating directly with another radio transceiver, cell phones communicate with cell sites directly and depend on a cellular network to function. The components of a cellular network are as follows. The mobile station, which is the cell phone or handset. The base transceiver station, BTS, which is the cell site or tower. The base station controller, or the BSC. The mobile telephone switching office, MTSO, and sometimes called the mobile switching services center, MSC. This is also called the switch and the Public Switch Telephone Network, or PSTN. This is the old copper telephone network. As an example, if a cell phone on the AT&T network called a cell phone on the Verizon network, the AT&T cell phone connects to an AT&T cell site. The call routes through the BSC to the AT&T switch also called the LAC, or the local area cell. The computers at the AT&T LAC would search the receiving phone number to see if it is on the AT&T network. When the network determined the second phone was not on the AT&T network, the call then routes to the PSTN, which would determine the receiving phone number was on the Verizon network. The call routes to the Verizon switch then the Verizon BSC, and then the closest tower to the phone, where the call to the phone completes. Cell phones are dependent upon cellular networks to function. Carriers keep records of cell phones' communication for billing and maintenance. We are able to obtain the records they maintain in the normal course of business and leverage them to the advantage of our investigations. Cell Sites Cell sites arrange in many different configurations, but the most common is in the form of a tower. Some carriers place cell sites on existing structures, such as buildings, water towers, or electrical towers. Some cell sites are designed to look like trees or flagpoles. The cell site in the photo here is a monopole design, and each level of antennas is a different carrier. A third party owns the cell site, and the cell site owner rents the space on the tower to the carriers. There are three levels on this tower, and each is for a different carrier. The ground equipment resides at the base of the tower. There will be ground equipment for each carrier having antennas on the tower. 
In this case, the tower has antennas for three companies, so there are three ground equipment units at the base of the tower. One part of our investigation should be to go to each cell site that is critical to our investigation. We should especially strive to survey each tower used around the time of the crime. Each carrier uses different types of ground equipment, and we can identify each carrier's equipment by data plates or by the type of equipment. Sprint's equipment is usually in gray metal cabinets and doesn't have any data plates or markings. Additionally, Sprint uses a white cone GPS antenna with a red base. Sprint is the only company I've seen that uses the red base on the GPS antenna. AT&T almost always uses a shelter to house its ground equipment. AT&T also places a data plate on the door of the shelter that usually has the AT&T logo on it. The shelters are usually air-conditioned and commonly have a generator nearby. Some AT&T ground equipment does not reside in a shelter, but it is usually clearly marked. T-Mobile equipment usually resides in gray cabinets, but distinct from Sprint. T-Mobile equipment is usually marked with a data plate. Like AT&T equipment, Verizon equipment is usually stored in the same type of shelter and has a Verizon data plate on the door. The shelters are usually air-conditioned and have a generator nearby. Verizon may have equipment outside a shelter, but it is usually clearly marked. Sectors. Three sectors usually make up each layer of a cell site. The equipment makes up a triangle with each face holding antennas in a different direction. When looked at from the top, we can think of the cell site like a pizza. If we cut the pizza into three slices, each slice would represent a sector. If the sectors are equal, each sector would be 120 degrees. A circle is 360 degrees, and 360 divided by 3 is 120. Most of the time, sector 1 is facing north, or sector 2 is facing south. Sector 1 usually faces north or northeast. Sector 2 usually faces south or southeast, and sector 3 usually faces southwest or northwest. We can map the sector by drawing lines from the cell site at the angle halfway between the direction of the sector and the directions of the neighboring sectors. We can also use the horizontal beam width information if it appears in the records. This example would represent sector 3 if sector 1 was facing north.